Satirists and comedians have always poked fun at those who set themselves up as being the arbiters of morality. Um, there's nothing new about this. Shakespeare mocked the Puritans through his character of Malvolio, uh, you know, the type of people who continually raged against the corrupting influence of the theatres and sought to close them down. In the 1960s, you had Joe Orton, the playwright, who brutally mocked the pomposity and hypocrisy of the establishment through his controversial plays. Uh, in his play, Loot, for instance, uh, the character of Faye, there's a moment where the character of Faye solemnly places a copy of the Ten Commandments on the casket of the dead Mrs. McCleavy. Uh, the Ten Commandments, she says. She was a great believer in some of them. <laughs> I think Joe Wharton is of particular interest to me because uh, his satirical exploits weren't just limited to the stage. For instance, he was so bored by the bland selection of books at his local library uh, that he used to modify the books by adding suggestive images to the covers or pasting new offensive blurbs onto the back of the dust jacket. And for this small act of creative vandalism, he actually served six months in prison. I'm not endorsing vandalism, by the way, but it was pretty funny. Uh, but he understood the satirical power of hoaxing. And one of the other things he liked to do was he used to like to write letters to the press uh, to complain about his own work <laughs> under the pseudonym of Mrs. Edna Wellthorpe. Uh, and some of the letters fooled the editors. So there was one in the Daily Telegraph, which was about his play Entertaining Mr. Sloan. Uh, and this is what Mrs. Wellthorpe says, quote, I was nauseated by this endless parade of mental and physical perversion. I hope that the ordinary decent people of this country will shortly strike back, end quote. <laughs> Orton actually even wrote a letter claiming that he was going to contact the Lord Chamberlain to see about getting his own plays censored. Now, the... the the kind of puritanism that Orwell was satirising never really goes away. It's always there. It just, it just comes back in different forms. Uh, we saw it with Mary Whitehouse in her Clean Up TV campaign of the 1960s. We saw it again in the, uh, the Video Nasties campaign of the 1980s. For a long time, a lot of this was coming from the right. You would hear, ban this filth from Mary Whitehouse devotees. That was a common refrain. And you'd have right-leaning tabloids such as the Daily Mail and the Daily Express. They would routinely call for censorship of art and comedy that they saw as corrupting the masses. But in its current form, these kinds of censorial ideas are coming from the left, which is a very curious development. Now, I think censorship is always a mistake, whether it comes from the right or the left, or whether it takes the form of the banning of films and books or the introduction of hate speech legislation, which is now favoured by supposed liberals. Of course, in truth, there is nothing liberal about any of this. We're now in the digital age, and this offers satirists a new avenue with which to attack the corruption of those in power. The Grievance Studies project by Helen Pluckrose, James Lindsay, and Peter Bogosian, who you've already heard from today, was essentially a satirical project because it sought to expose the fraudulence that still exists within the powerful institution of academia. I'd say personally that anyone who is in higher education owes them a, a debt of gratitude, because if you care about something, you want to see it improve. Of course, I'm aware uh, that not everyone sees it that way. But for my part, I've tried to use social media to satirise the social justice movement, which makes a lot of sense, uh, given that this is the arena within which their ideas are disseminated. It's a way to fight them on their own turf. Now, last April, I invented a character on Twitter called Titania McGrath. Uh, Titania is a social justice activist, a fourth wave feminist, an intersectionalist. She's also hay racial, which means that she, her racial identity tends to fluctuate according to the pollen count. <laughs> she's a militant vegan. Uh, she's ecosexual, which means she only has sex with plant life. Um, occasionally she will write some devastating slam poetry in an effort to dismantle the patriarchy. Uh, she's also incredibly rich, by the way, um, with a house in Kensington and another one in Val d'Isere. Uh, she's one of those very posh women who go on and on about how oppressed they are. Um, you, you know, the young white women who are really obsessed with their own oppression. I mean, anyone who reads columns in The Guardian will know the type of person I'm talking about. <laughs> so I'm aware, I'm, I'm totally aware uh, that not everyone will have heard of the character Titania McGrath. Not, uh, not everyone's on Twitter for one thing. Some of you have lives. So, uh, so by way of illustration, I thought I'd just, I'd just read out a few examples of the kind of things that she tweets, okay? So, I have absolutely no desire to impregnate a male, 
But if I ever change my mind, I won't allow some scientist to tell me that I can't. <laughs> Speaking or writing in English is an act of colonial violence. <laughs> the only way to stop fascism is if the state are allowed to arrest people for what they say and think. <laughs> Gender is a destructive social construct, and the best way to prove this is to construct as many new genders as possible. <laughs> and just one more. Hey, white people, if you really want to understand your privilege, try identifying as black for a month. You wouldn't believe the disapproving looks I get when I tell people I'm an ethnic minority. <laughs> So that's the gist. Now, this obsession with, with victimhood from predominantly bourgeois political commentators is something I've always found inherently amusing. And on social media, these latter-day Puritans can pontificate to the masses, berate anyone who falls short of their own moral expectations, and endlessly trawl through old tweets and social media posts in the hope of discovering a misjudged phrase or sentiment that, that could justify a campaign of public shaming. In their eyes, there is no possibility of redemption. The most vicious remarks you will ever see on social media come from either the racist far right or woke intersectionalists. They are really two heads of the same chimera. And to be clear, I'm not suggesting some kind of moral equivalence there. One of the most tragic things I think about the social justice movement is that it is largely well-intentioned. Um, American physicist Steven Weinberg famously remarked that, quote, with or without religion, good people can behave well and bad people can do evil. But for good people to do evil, that takes religion, end quote. It makes sense then to think of the social justice movement as a kind of cult. Its members are generally good people with good intentions. They have an unshakable certainty that their worldview is correct. They feel the need to proselytize and convert as many of the fallen as possible. And even though they are capable of the most horrendous dehumanizing behavior, they still think they're the good guys. Satire is about trying to affect some kind of change of seeing something wrong in society, making it look ridiculous, trying to make things better. The poet W.H. Auden put this very well. He said, quote, satire is angry and optimistic. It believes that the evil it attacks can be abolished. Comedy is good-tempered and pessimistic. It believes that however much we may wish we could, we cannot change human nature and we must make the best of a bad job, end quote. So there's a real optimism behind what I'm trying to do with Titania McGrath, because I'm convinced that we can and we should challenge the dominant orthodoxies that generate so much resentment among normal people who are sick of being hectored by paternalistic moralists who claim the power to divine their secret thoughts. Earlier this year, Titania published her first book, which is Woke, A Guide to Social Justice. I've, uh, I've been reading about subliminal imagery, so I'm gonna hold this up every now and then in the hope that the suggestible audience will buy the book. Um, and I was very pleased, because although the, the critical response was overwhelmingly positive, I was very happy with it. Uh, the woke commentariat weren't very happy about this book. In fact, they, they generally misinterpreted the book as being punching down at minority groups. But of course, minorities are never my target. I mean, given I've spent all my life standing up for gay rights and gender equality and, and being a vocal opponent of racism in all its forms, it would be a weird career move for me to start knocking minority groups. No, I'm, I'm punching up at the woke establishment, the people who claim to be caretakers of other people's feelings, a social justice ideology that legitimizes bullying and whose members insist on patronizing minority groups by assuming that they are too delicate to take criticism or ridicule. I don't mind that Titania makes people angry. It's not everyone's cup of tea. And of course, you're not gonna find it funny if you're the target. Satire can only really be successful if you're annoying somebody. It's said that the, the ancient Greek satirical poet Hipponax was so fierce in his invective that some of those he was ridiculing actually hanged themselves in despair. That takes some skill. <laughs> it's quite impressive. I, I would not presume to have that level of ability, but I think it's fair to say that I have annoyed the right people. The wonderful thing about the people who are offended by the book is that they invariably end up sounding like Titania. So there was one reviewer in The New Statesman who was so high-handed and moralistic and weirdly ageist, which is another blind spot that Titania has, 
uh, that a number of people, legitimately, a number of people contacted me to ask me if I had written that review as a hoax. <laughs> because it just sounded like her. Uh, but my favourite review, this will come as no surprise at all, was in The Guardian. Um, and the reviewer said that everyone in hell would be given a copy, which, which would <laughs> at least increase the circulation. Um, and she said that laughing at the language of social justice is a cheap shot. Uh, she also accused me of cashing in. That's the phrase she used, cashing in. Now, here's the thing. I'm a comedic writer and performer, and I wrote a comedy book. Now, if that is cashing in, I, that would be like saying that when I was a paper boy, I used to cash in by pushing newspapers through people's letterbox. So the woke movement, though, is a very difficult beast to satirise, and this is because of the way in which it perceives itself. It's incredibly insular. It's comprised of very privileged, very powerful people who are nonetheless convinced of their own victimhood. They're small in number, but they're dominant in cultural influence. They are overrepresented in the media. They are overrepresented in the arts. They are overrepresented in academia. They are overrepresented in the, in the quangos that make uh, so many of the decisions that impact on our society. Uh, to give you an example of this, the, the, the Advertising Standards Agency in the UK recently banned two adverts on the basis that they thought they were promoting gender stereotypes. So one of the adverts was in a restaurant, there was a conveyor belt at the restaurant, and it was two fathers who left their babies on the conveyor belt while they were stuffing their faces with cream cheese. And that perpetuated a negative stereotype about men. And the second one was for Volkswagen, and there was a bit in the, in the advert which clearly showed a woman sitting next to a pram thereby dangerously implying that some women can be mothers. <laughs> but most worrying of all for me is that the social justice, the social justice movement is overrepresented among the Silicon Valley tech giants who seek to control the parameters of acceptable expression on social media. I mean, YouTube, Google, Facebook, they literally employ thousands of people to monitor the content uh, online. Titania herself has actually been suspended from Twitter on numerous occasions. Uh, once for seven days just a couple of weeks ago. And once she was banned permanently uh, for tweeting out, uh, what she tweeted was that she planned to attend a UKIP rally in order to punch people in the name of tolerance. And she got banned for that. Uh, and they said it was a permanent ban, but then there was a bit of a backlash, and then she got reinstated, and then she got an extra 20,000 followers in 24 hours. It's, it's called the Streisand effect, you know. But it proves the point which is that those in power do not like to be mocked. They hate it. And to put it simply, the woke are the establishment. They, the woke are the establishment, but they believe themselves to be the underdogs. That's a really hard thing to deal with. This is why they simply do not recognize themselves in Titania. They just can't see it. One of the most common criticisms I get all the time is that I am attacking a straw man, that there is simply no one like her, either online or in the real world. But I would, I would put it to my critics that if that is the case, I would like them to explain why it is that virtually every time I tweet as Titania, a number of people take it seriously and get angry about her. If there were no real life Titanias out there, why would anyone ever take her seriously? Why is it that two weeks ago, the famous feminist Naomi Wolf engaged her in conversation about the anti-trans movement. Why did that happen? You know, wh why did the NatWest Bank's customer service department reply in earnest when Titania complained that the bank was inciting violence against vegans? <laughs> why did that happen? You know, why did one American TV host invite Titania onto her show to talk about something she tweeted? People do take her seriously. And that would suggest to us that those people do exist. And what I've done in the book, there it is again, in case you didn't see it, um, the book, right, I've interspersed, I deliberately interspersed the book with, with genuine quotations from real life social justice activists because I, I hope that shows that some of her more ludicrous utterances are not a million miles away from what activists actually say. So for instance, the LGBTQIA plus activist, Munro Bergdorf, is quoted in Titania's book as saying, quote, you can still be homeless and have white privilege, end quote. That's exactly the kind of thing that Titania would say. She also quotes, I've also quoted in the book, I should stop saying she, that's really unhealthy, like it's someone else. She, she also quotes Professor Rochelle Gutierrez from the University of Illinois, who said that, quote, on many levels, mathematics itself operates as whiteness, end quote. Titania agrees with this wholeheartedly and points out that the KKK were once known to set fire to plus signs 
in order to intimidate their victims. So, and in, in, in January of this year, the UK's leading satirical magazine, Private Eye, published a quotation from Titania in their Sued's Corner, which is a regular feature that mocks the most ridiculous, pretentious things that people have said during the week. And Titania had claimed, she was advertising her book, and she had claimed that she had written the most important book of 2019, and that readers should buy it not for her sake, but for the sake of humanity. Private Eye quoted this and then added a mocking cartoon, not realising that the woman they quoted was a non-existent character. So we're left with this bizarre situation in which a satirical magazine is satirising a satirical character because they don't realise she's satirical. <laughs> so it's simply not true to say that I'm attacking a straw man. Not only are there real-life Titanias, but they have infiltrated the mainstream. This is what concerns me. In August of last year, for another example, in August of last year, I posted a tweet as Titania, uh, from Titania's account, complaining about that scene in Mary Poppins, you know, when she gets uh, soot on her face, chimney soot on her face. And Titania was saying that this was blackface and obviously racist. Now, this is obviously completely absurd. Fast forward six months, February of this year, and the New York Times ran an article, and this was the headline, Mary Poppins and a nanny's shameful flirting with blackface, accompanied by an image almost identical to the one I had posted. Right? So I had anticipated that by six months. I'm not saying I'm a prophet, <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> but it's not the only time that Titania has made suggestions that have eventually come true. As I say, not saying I'm a prophet. Just leave that with you. It is this mainstreaming of social justice that really troubles me the most. You know, if, if it were just a minority of idiots on the internet just shouting at each other, it wouldn't be an issue, right? But the, the idiots are now running the show. So. I'll give you an example. Recently in Humberside, here in the UK, a man in Humberside was investigated by the police because he retweeted a poem that was deemed to be transphobic. He didn't even write the poem. He just retweeted the poem. And the investigating police officer said to him, we need to check your thinking. Just think about that phrase. We need to check your thinking. And the man said to him, have I committed a crime? The police said, no, you haven't committed a crime. This is a non-crime hate incident. This is now standard practice amongst the UK police. If you don't believe me, the government has a website dedicated to hate crime, which has a whole section on non-crime hate incidents. You can look it up for yourselves. But here's the thing, in a free society, the police have absolutely no business investigating non-crime. And the police, when they were called on to defend themselves, said, although this in itself wasn't a crime, the thing about crime is that it is often preceded by non-crime. <laughs> well, yeah. It couldn't be any other way. Like, this would be like your doctor phoning you up and saying, oh, I hear you're really healthy. Why didn't you let me know? Because the thing is, poor health can be preceded by good health. Makes no sense, you know? We have a problem in the UK. Over 3,000 people a year in the UK are arrested for offensive things that they say online. And that's due to a thing called the 2003 Electronic Communications Act, an act which ought to be repealed. The problem is uh, there's no appetite in Parliament amongst MPs to oppose woke legislation or woke ideas. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of the people who are saying these things online that they're getting arrested and investigated for and occasionally going to prison for, some of the things they're saying are awful. They are genuinely horrible, nasty things. But here's the thing, if you, if you, it's the price you pay for living in a free society is bad people are gonna say bad things, basically. Authoritarianism is not the answer. The answer to bad speech is more speech. And I think the other, the other example of the mainstreaming of social justice, it's also evident in the fact that even respected national newspapers don't seem to understand the basic definitions of phrases like fascist, alt-right, and even far right, they no longer know what these words mean and they are just banding them about promiscuously, which is really damaging. Now, if you claim the right to redefine the word Nazi to just include anyone who disagrees with you politically, then of course you can also claim that there is an epidemic of Nazism. But in doing so, you are also inadvertently acting in the interests of the worst kinds of people. Fascism, and white supremacy are not compatible with a civilized society. And so it really troubles me to see the woke movement feeding this thankfully very small, but still very dangerous neo-Nazi movement. 
giving them far more credibility and attention than they deserve. So I would call on, call on them to stop doing these people these favours. We, we should be opposing the far right, not acting as their PR. It doesn't help to grant these people the status of martyrdom. It doesn't help to surrender the principle of free speech, the cornerstone of any democratic society, to surrender that principle to the far right, to, the, to allow the far right to claim it as their principle. That's really dangerous. This isn't about left and right. And I've been speaking to people today at the conference all day. Right? I think the people in this room really do represent a, a broad spectrum of diff different ideas. You know, with, there are people here from across the political spectrum, all sorts of beliefs, atheists, religious, there's genuine diversity in this room, but it's the kind of diversity that the social justice movement cannot stand. It's diversity of ideas. And I think we understand, don't we, though, all of us, what we do share, I think, is that we understand that freedom of speech, and by extension, freedom of thought, without those things, nothing else can be achieved. If you look back to the new left movements of the 60s and the 70s, the civil rights movements, those who had to fight for black emancipation, for gay rights, for women's rights, they all understood that without free speech, theirs was a lost cause. That is why social justice is fundamentally a reactionary movement. It's trying to unpick the good work of the civil rights movement. It is comprised of people who just simply will not tolerate difference of opinion. That is the very definition of bigotry. And you'll often hear them using that word, won't you? A lot of them hear them saying, using bigot as a slur. If they had a dictionary to hand, they would realise that it's better applied to themselves. So to finish, uh, I'd just like to return to where I started, which is how satire in the age of social media can effectively expose these problems. As I've said, part of the appeal of Titania is that even now there are some people who don't get that she's not real. They can't decide whether she's real or not. And I find that a lot of fun. Obviously, it hasn't helped that I was outed against my will. I didn't want that to happen. Uh, but I think there's still some more fun to be had. So in August of last year, the New York Times ran an anonymous letter. It was called, How Can I Cure My White Guilt? Anonymous letter, right? It was just signed, Whitey. And it was a person who described themselves as being riddled with shame for being white. And the whole thing was obviously ridiculous and obviously a hoax. So Titania claimed that she had written it. And she provided screenshots of the letter on her hard drive with the date just to prove that she was the author. Now, whether she did write it or not is not for me to say. <laughs> now, actually, perhaps her claim to authorship is just another hoax in of itself. But really, it doesn't actually matter, does it? Because the point is that a major publication is happy to publish any old nonsense so long as it is sufficiently woke. The social justice ideology has infected our mainstream media and irreparably degraded its standards. That's what these hoaxes reveal. Another hoax perpetrated against The Guardian newspaper. They published an anonymous article in 2016, again anonymous, in which the writer claimed that watching Sam Harris videos on YouTube had eventually lured him into a state of near fascism. You know that slippery slope fallacy. Again, absolutely, utterly preposterous from start to finish. And it was satirising the very prejudices that would lead so many to believe in its authenticity. Now, that article was claimed by the online troll Godfrey Elfwick, who is a genderqueer Muslim atheist who has since been permanently banned, totally banned from Twitter, but now writes a column for The Spectator USA. And that character is authored by a friend of mine, Lisa Graves, and again, I, I wouldn't like to say whether she wrote that Gar Guardian article or not. I think what's important is the impact of the hoax. That's what really matters here. So I'll leave you with just one more example. So in February of this year, a, a writer called Liam Evans wrote a piece for the Independent newspaper, it's a UK newspaper. And he cited a number of ex extremely talented comedians, people like Dave Chappelle, Ricky Gervais, Finn Taylor, and others. And he said that their jokes about sensitive topics amounted to hate speech. He said that these kind of jokes, and I quote, should be subject to investigation. It simply isn't good enough for comedians to cry free speech after every hateful joke, as though the laws that govern the rest of us don't apply to them, end quote. Again, no one should be taking this seriously. 
It is flagrantly authoritarian. It's clearly a hoax. In fact, a number of prominent comedians complained to The Independent asking why they were publishing such clearly fabricated stuff. And that is a good question. But really, I think the pressing question is more broad than that, which is, what has happened to our media? Why is a respected national newspaper publishing drivel by a writer that no one has ever heard of just because it's pushing a woke agenda? What does that tell us? And the other question they should have been asking is, why is it that it is the left that are publishing this kind, these kind of censorial articles that used to grace the pages of the right-wing tabloids? And if it takes a hoaxer to provoke a little self-reflection, then, then surely that's a good thing. Again, I do not want to speculate as to the authorship of that article. But I would point out one thing which I do find a little bit curious. Right? The article is still on the Independence website if you want to have a look. And I would invite you to look for yourselves. You might be interested to note that if you take the fourth letter of every sentence in that article, it actually spells out the phrase... Titania McGrath wrote this, you gullible hacks. Which, frankly, is an amazing coincidence. Thank you very much.